Hey guys, it's Loman02, uh, currently getting ready to replay a couple games of old school MTG. Um, the first is with um, a Rug Zoo deck, Urnum deck, Delver deck. You give it a name. Um, essentially, it is a creature based aggressive deck that is blue, red, and green. Um, and it utilizes the most efficient threats at the cost of economy and tries to close the game rapidly with creature threats and burn. So, here is the opener. The opener seems okay. I don't know what my uh, opponent, Nola Cola, is playing. But I do have a strip mine. Uh, turn one black vice that can get in some incremental damage. I'm on the play, or question, draw, which is slightly worse with a black vice. I'd rather them be drawing. But the hand is, is decent enough. I can cast um, everything in my hand. Uh, but we would ideally like a better permanent-based uh, source of damage outside of Black Vice. My opponent's also playing an aggro or combo. They could very easily dump their hand. We see an Ivory Tower turn one, which, you know, actually nullifies the Black Vice. But the interesting thing with Ivory Tower is and why I don't care for the card as much. Unless you have significant card draw, it's very tough to gain a lot of value out of it. Because it's a permanent out of your hand, which means your hand size is automatically reduced by it. And in and of itself, it doesn't really do much. Um, but, you know, in, in a deck that can draw large volumes of cards, um, it can obviously have some significant impact on the game. Draw very well my first turn into an Urnum Jin. Opponent plays a Mana Vault, a card I'm not very high on outside of, like, uh, Workshop Aggro decks, just because it often tends to just be, you know, a, a constantly tap City of Brass, uh, because untapping it in this format tends to be fairly difficult. I, I haven't seen it yet, at least. I don't play it in a lot of my decks, though, so maybe I don't give it enough of a chance. Um... So, opponent, you know, we strip mine on opponent, play on our flying men, and pass it back. Opponent's out of ivory tower range at this point. Uh, not that it would matter, because black vice and ivory tower kind of balance out. Uh, opponent has their own strip mine, which stinks. Uh, we go ahead and see if there's a swords to plowshares in our opponent's hand. I think that's the right play there. Uh, we could have played curd ape as opposed to doing that. But I have a strong suspicion that our opponent is not on swords to plowshares at this point. Um... Not that I think they would have popped it off on the Flying Men, but, you know, at the same time, like, once I do draw land, I would prefer them to have Swords to Plowshare my Flying Men. It is a riskier line, though, to take to, to use the Unstable Mutation, but the other, uh, the other uh, part is is that I'm not really using my mana efficiently if I just cast a, light, a Chain Lightning or a Curd Ape at that point, and I figure I might as well try to press the advantage. My opponent is obviously down on cards. We draw out a two tiger. Well, we draw out an ancestral recall, which is like one of the best draws in our deck. Probably actually the best, because at this point, it's not like we want to, you know, just have more mana instantly and something like Black Lotus. It'd be preferable to have more cards to draw into land at that point in time. We do draw into land, as you can see, have a larger Curd Ape and a Serendip Freet, and start beating down on our opponent. Um. We get bolted. Opponent appears to be on a Jeskai-based deck that has lots of removal. Uh, they play a Saren Dip of their own, which actually I'm happy to see at this point, because I have Chain Lightning and Psionic Blast. I know they're already taking one off the Saren Dip of Freet, even though mine will bounce off of it if I try to attack. And they're also taking one from the Mana Vault. So right now I can do 7 damage, and that puts them at a virtual 2 because of their own cards. And they're on 2 cards in hand. Ancestral definitely sealed the deal on this game. Um, I'm not going to say it was anything else. It wasn't really stellar play, it was just Ancestral. Um, drawing me into the mana sources I needed on pretty much an all-gas hand. Put them down to four. They uh, draw their card for the turn, take two, and I believe they go ahead and concede it here, realizing that it's probably impossible for them to win. Outside of, like, disenchanting their own uh, Muta Vault, or, I'm sorry, Mana Vault, and Swords to Plowsharing their own Serendip Freet, they're not going to be able to live one more turn. And even if they do that, then I'm hitting them for three, and they would be at five at that point, down to one, um, which would still put them dead. So there really weren't a lot of outs there. So that's game one. Relatively fast, furious. Okay, this hand is risky because it's very slow, but I keep it because of the power of strip mine. And I do draw into gas here. I draw into a Serendip of which is a solid pickup. Opponent is gaining a, a decent bit of incremental life off the Ivory Tower here, but I'm able to snipe this uh, this Mistress Factory, which I do because it puts my opponent back on mana and also gets rid of a very good threat in their deck. Draw Strip Mine, which I, I assume will decentivize their activation of uh, Mistress Factory, but don't use it here because actually right now what I care about probably more is getting this uh, Serendip of Freed online. 
there's a, a decent chance that it gets towards the plowshare, but I actually kind of like playing the Serendip out first. One, it's the most mana efficient play we can make. And two, it actually allows us to know if they have swords to plowshares in hand, which means that at some point we can unstable mutation our flying men um, later on down the road when we want to get in for more damage. Or we can just unstable mutation the threat we currently have. Um, the Serendib. Take our one and have to like it. Draw very well into our red elemental blast. Just a sideboard good that we brought in. Play out the flying men and have plans to strip mine on their upkeep. Go ahead and strip mine the Mishra's Factory here. They draw their own strip mine. We're both at a, a bad mana situation. But the difference is, well, when I draw like a Luxac into Black Lotus, and also I have three cards I can cast on one land, all unstable mutation. My opponent appears to be on very little removal in hand. They double bolt my Urnum Gym, which I'm 100% fine with. I mean, I guess it is kind of a two for two because we did have to spend Black Lotus to cast it. I'm still kind of timorous to cast out the Unstable Mutation because I'd rather just get incremental value off the cards I have in play. They draw their removal, and as opposed to keeping it, they um, they actually just pop it off there, which is awesome, and it tells me a little bit about their play style. I think they want to hold it until my turn, although I can see them being timorous about doing that just in case I have Counter Magic, but I'm on one land here. Um, at this point, I have Red Elemental Blast, but I'm not really interested in casting it. I'm just going to cast on the permanent threats. Or, I'm sorry, I have two Unstable Mutations, but I'm not interested in casting those just in case he has removal like this. Now, when he's tapped out, I have no problems uh, enchanting uh, my Flying Men, and I end up winning the game because of it. Um, is it possible we could have won if we had taken a more aggressive line? Yeah, possibly, but our opponent obviously had a lot of removal. So, Chain Lightning, Swords to Plowshares, uh, Lightning Bolt, you know, that's, that's a significant bit. And I don't know what their last card is, but evidently they flooded out because I believe they tell us at the end here. So Rug Del Delver uh, wins that match um, against Jess Guy. Um, to show you this deck, so I, I showed this in an earlier video, but I've made some significant modifications to it. One Mana Drain has come out. Um, and as opposed to, to having Mana Drain in there, um, we have... Uh, what did we add? Added Black Vice in. Black Vice is a card I forgot. Now, interestingly enough, and actually we changed the sideboard too, I removed one blue Elemental Blast, and I believe one red Elemental Blast as well, and put in two Artifact Blasts. The reason I think this card is actually necessary as a sideboard good is because of City in a Bottle. City in a Bottle, if you're not familiar with the card, is an Arabian Nights printed uh, two-mana artifact that when it comes into play, it destroys all cards originally printed in the Arabian Nights expansion set. And any card played after um, it is in play, or while it is in play, uh, is destroyed upon entering the battlefield. So what that does effectively is destroys all of these guys right here, destroys all of my Serendib uh, Freets, destroys Flying Men, destroys Unstable Mutation, uh, and I have to double-check on that. I believe Unstable Mutation is from, uh, originally from, uh, from uh, Arabian Nights. And it also destroys uh, my Cities of Brass and my Library of Alexandria. So, as you look at that, Serendip Freed is kind of the backbone of the deck. I actually built this deck with uh, with playing Urnum Jin in mind. But Urnum Jin is, is actually kind of just like a big finisher that sometimes randomly gets a hit in here or there. But Serendip Freed is definitely the backbone of the, the flagship threat of this deck. Um... You know, and realistically, it's, you know, you're using that to suck down the one-for-one -one removal because generally they have to. And then utilizing an unstable mutation after they have wasted their removal on the Serendip of Freed. Either it's a two-for-one or a one-for-one -one on Swords to Plowshares. Um, you're using an unstable mutation at that point on a much lesser threat like Kurt Ape or Flying Men to, to kill them. Um, so those are the changes to the deck. Mana Drain out, uh, Black Vice in main. Now, one curious thing that I think is probably worth some consideration is, you know, and it'll come up in a match that I play here in a moment, um, is the card Berserk. Um, if Well, actually, Moto is going to be very slow because I think I have uh, this on zero right now for the quantity. Um, so if we go to one here, we should be able to see it. Um, and it's probably going to pull up a bunch of Berserker cards, but once uh, it gets, yeah. Um, Berserk here um, is a card that I actually think is worth consideration in this deck, at least as a singleton. Maybe more. Um, so, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like, I was studying this card right here, um, and I think, you know, and for, for argument's sake or just for, you know, I guess the, the dialogue about this deck, we'll also pull up Giant Growth. And actually, I probably should have put Growth because that's going to pull up a whole slew of cards. 
Um, so unstable mutation is interesting to me um, from a design perspective. So auras are naturally risky cards in, in just the game of Magic. Um, you know, outside of ones that draw you cards or like totem armor, um, generally speaking, they're kind of risky in nature just due to the fact that um, I don't think I have original uh, art uh, giant growth. So we'll just uh, we'll pull this one in. There's giant growth. Um, so... Why do I think Unstable Mutation is better than Giant Growth in this deck? Well, here's the thing with un Unstable Mutation. I look at Unstable Mutation as essentially saying on it, um, Lightning Bolt Rebound. Now, it's not quite Lightning Bolt Rebound, or Lightning Bolt, you know, deal 3 damage, rebound, uh, where it deals, deals 6 damage. But it's it's pretty darn close. Um, if, if it works the way you want it to, it, it's exactly that. Um, so I think it requires more setup than the fictional card I'm telling you about, Lightning Bolt with Rebound. Um, and obviously it's not quite Rebound, it takes three turns to do it, because it has parasitic results. It's three damage, just like Lightning Bolt, the first turn it hits phase, two damage, and then one damage, for a total of six, which would be the fictional card I'm describing. Um, so where does Unstable Mutation shine? Well, it shines in a deck like this, where I'm trying to prey upon decks that are a little slower, and my... My main threats in the deck are evasive in nature. Um, you know, so Flying Men, Serendip, Free combine very well to turn Unstable Mutation into the fictional, you know, Lightning Bolt Rebound that I am describing. Um, if they're not removed. And that's where the setup comes in. Unstable Mutation is generally not the first avenue to victory you want to take with the deck. Generally speaking, you want to use it just to close games out. Um, in one to two turns after you've already bled the opponent's hand of what you assume to be relevant removal. Um, you know, and even if you're only able to get one hit in with it, generally Lightning Bolt is good enough because then you can finish the opponent off with your other burn like Psionic Blast or Chain Lightning or a literal Lightning Bolt. So, you know, there are decks out there that play also play Giant Growth, um, and generally they tend to be more so like weenie-based decks with like Scrib Sprites and Flying Men. Which this deck is kind of a hybrid between like the Flying Men deck and more of like a rug, you know, rug, you know, Delver deck. Um, so where does Giant Growth come in? Giant Growth is more so a card that um, that is beneficial in racing situations. Um, well, I don't want to say racing situations. We're exchange, so trading. It's more interactive, I guess, is the way to put it. Unstable Mutation is a less interactive card. Well. Intera un uninteractive in the way that really all it's good for is ending the game. It's not great for trading your threats. I mean, sure, you could force chumps with it, but typically speaking, that's not how you want to use the stable mutation, by forcing chumps. What Giant Growth does is something that's slightly different, and I think it is more so for the weenie-style deck, because you know, you're either trying to combo with Berserk, or you're trying to use Giant Growth to protect your, your fewer threats. Um, and or um, trade giant growth up the curve for like a phantom monster, you know, an air elemental, whatever. Something that's significantly larger than, you know, the one one that you're likely um, using this on. Um, so giant growth has its time and place, but I don't think this is the deck for it. However, I will say that I think Berserk is probably worthy of considering at least as a singleton in this deck. And looking at the deck, the first thing that comes to mind that I would likely cut is the Sylvan Library, even though I'm sad to see it go because... You know, you tend to want to have your, your few draw engines that you can have available. Um, and I suppose there's other things that we could use, you know, like maybe Sinbad or something like that. Um, but, but Berserk is definitely worth consideration. In the next game I'll show you, I'll kind of show you why I think it might be. Um, the deck actually surprised me, and I'm not going to show you the full game set um, of this game right here, because this was a very long game. Actually, the, the game was interesting, this the entire match was interesting, because... I had to force a game four by intentionally drawing off of the two damage from a psionic blast to actually uh, do lethal damage to an opponent um, because they had spirit linked um, a Serendip free on my side of the board, which, you know, I actually haven't seen that interaction. And it's actually very good because it, it essentially stops the Serendib. Um, and also just randomly gains them life every turn. So our first hand was was unkeepable. Um, it didn't have blue mana, and it didn't have ca it had blue spells. So essentially had a bunch of uncastables. This hand is very risky. So here's my going in line. I am going to play Library of Alexandria, go down to five cards, draw up to six next turn, not play a land, and then draw into my seventh and try to outcard my opponent. 
Well, my opponent, Dockman, is playing here is a very interesting deck. I think it's a little janky, but it's actually very good against the strategy that I'm playing right now. So what he's playing is essentially a mono green splash white for removal, disenchant, um, spirit link, and swords to plowshares. Um, but basically a mono green deck that ramps into... Um, force of Nature, either Spirit links it or plays out a Circle of Protection green and then just doesn't pay the, the uh, cumulative up... Or not the cumulative, but the upkeep of four red green mana. Um, so the issue with seeing a card like, um, like Force of Nature is this deck cannot really kill it unless it, like, three... Well, two for one or three for once itself to get rid of it. So it has to, uh, ideally, in an ideal world, race it. Um, this hand is not well set up for racing, so I don't like it. But I also know that my deck, which is playing Unstable Mutations and Flying Men, is probably not going to do better than this um, by mulliganing to 5 on the play. So I keep this hand, and my going-in strategy is to try to get back up on cards by actually slow-rolling my lands. Opponent plays out fast mana because their deck contains basically all of the fast mana available. So, like, you have basically four um, four uh, Birds of Paradise, four Land of War Elves. We get Swords to Plow shared after going into uh, the initial plan that I described. Uh, at this point, Whirling Dervish is the only threat that we know our opponent has. So I play out the Mistress Factory, although it does bite me a bit because it would have enabled me on the following turn to, to, play, um, to possibly play more spells. Uh, but this does hold back the Whirling Dervish, which is really the only threat I think I need to be worried about here. Unfortunately, our opponent either draws into this next card, or they got two mana they needed to play it. So Force of Nature comes down, and we're in a very bad spot because we have done absolutely zero damage to our opponent. And they have an 8-8 Trampler on the board, which is bigger than anything I can really produce outside of like multiple unstable mutations on one threat. Which is really still a multiple for one, if you will. So I play the Saren Dib out and intend on blocking out the Whirling Dervish and any 1-1s one that attack. We take 8 to the face, take 1 from the Saren Dib, draw again, find Lightning Bolt, play Bolt on one of the 1-1s. Uh, one Although in retrospect, it was possible that I wanted to go to face with that. But I actually don't think so because here's my gambit. Like I knew need, I need to damage my opponent. Like, I need to damage them so I can try to race them because I'm just not going to want to block this Force of Nature around at a 3-for-1 exchange rate. Um, but the worst is actualized here. Spirit Link is played on is played on the Force of Nature. The opponent is obviously a lot of... Well, is all out of gas at this point. But Spirit Link is rough. So Spirit Link is essentially like the... It's from Legends, and it's one of the first cards that gave quote-unquote Life Link. So the interesting thing about Spirit Link is, like, the damage actually... It, so the card's effect stacks, um, which so it's not an evergreen ability. Um, and actually, the original Exalted Angel, you know, before it was Oracle, did not have Life Link. It, it actually hit, and um, you, you gained the life on the stack. Um, and some of the older cards are like that. This is really the first card, you know... I mean, like, yeah, sure, there's Healing Salve, but this is the first card that gave creatures the ability to lifelink, um, in a way. But the interesting thing is, you can still hit, like, so for instance, like, let's say I hit with Serendip a Freet on my opponent, they would still go to 20, but then they'd go back up to 23 after the stack resolved with Spirit uh, Link on it. But this is bad news because they're gaining 8 life, and I am on an attack deck that has size of, has much smaller creatures. So my hand is not great. I did bring in the Tranquility because I thought there was an off chance. One of them, not two of them. I thought there was an off chance that I would actually want one copy of Tranquility to be able to deal with the uh, Circle of Protection green. Because that allows me to attack with my Urnum Jins. And it also um, gets rid of the cop green, you know, just to, to, to force them to pay four mana a turn for their force of nature. Um, so we're in a bad situation. Opponent 23, we're at four life. We're going to take one from the Serendib every turn. So we need to put enough power or question toughness on the board and ideally power to foment a trade with the force of nature. So we draw into Serendib, which is a great draw. Um, play out the Serendib. Um, Enchant it, making a 6-7. Now, I think... No, actually, I don't misplay here. So I have to stay back, because if my opponent just attacks with both the 1-1s, one um, then I'm going to die. Um, or I'm very likely to. So we get Time Twistered here. Um, and opponent luckily hits a lot of air, hits a lot of mana. 
off of this. They do hit their circle protection green, but they have two cards that I assume are not removal because I think they would have removed one of my threats just to get in. I'm in a very dubious life total of four. That means I have to win this turn because my own Saren Dibs will kill me. I draw into Chain Lightning. Now, this is where the, the game gets interesting. Like, I actually don't realize that, like, just looking at this when I draw the bolt, that, like, I actually do have lethal. Um... And as soon as I equip this thing, for lack of better terms, with, uh, you know, number two and number three unstable mutations, um, I realize, holy crap, like, I can do, you know, 23 damage here and put my opponent to negative one, which is, is pretty amazing. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it shows that this deck's efficiency, you know, is, is something to behold. Uh, because I'm essentially able to spin my whole hand. Now, my going in plan before my opponent time twister, which is very fortuitous for us, was that I was going to have to resolve my own time twister. Um, so there's a couple considerations here. I don't think Force of Nature is like a common threat in the old school format. I mean, it's not you know impossible to consider it. Um, but you know, there's a couple ways of attacking this style of deck or decks that just play bigger creatures than we're capable of exchanging our cards with and can race us effectively given this was a very slow draw um and i i took a calculated risk in keeping um, a hand that couldn't really do much damage early um at the cost of getting card economy off library but you know even like something like juzam jim can be problematic um and the consideration is this like we can either play something like control magic to steal like big behemoths like force of nature um you know, against this deck specifically that we're playing against, you know, Earthquake in the sideboard would be great because if we Earthquake on turn three, we probably just win the game because our opponent is down to two cards and has no mana. Um, or, you know, the, the other option uh, that we could we could look at is Bounce. So we could play cards like Boomerang or Unsummon um, to buy time. Um, of those options, I think the ones that I, I like best are probably the Control Magic variety of answers. Um, just due to the fact that where I'm tend to, I'm, I think I'm going to tend to do it more often than not is against the, either the green or black based decks, uh, possibly red based decks. So like Shiv and Dragon is not an impossible thing to see. Um, you know, Force of Nature, obviously I'm seeing it here. Uh, but the other cards that, that it gets that, that I think are more common are, are cards like, uh, um, uh, the, uh, Juzam, not Juzam Jin, but, uh, Urnam Jin, Juzam Jin, and then, um, you know, e even Serendib Afrit to a lesser extent, uh, Serendib uh, Jin, um, Sierra Angel. So I think it's worth consideration to play like one, maybe one control magic in the sideboard. And control magic, just like, you know, it, it, it has been in its five mana printings, um, it's a two for one exchange rate essentially, because, you know, you either get a threat out of it, um, or you get a threat and the opponent is forced to, you know, two for one themselves to get rid of that threat so they don't die to it. Um, so. All of that, that aside, sorry for that didactic exp explanation. Uh, we go ahead and chain lightning here. Um, we are kind of sneaky, um, so I, I tell my opponent, "Hey, you know," I, I say, <laughs> "I say cheeky, lol, good game, man." You know, and I'm being a little bit of a sneaky or a sneaky bastard here. My thinking is, "Hey, if he has swords to plowshares, like he may not use it here." Although I'm pretty sure that if he had it. He would have used it in response to the first unstable mutation. Um, but if he does randomly have it, he's trying to mise us. I go ahead and just uh, say that to see if I can get him not to so I can lightning bolt after I attack. Because the game's not over just due to this attack. I can only get him down to two at this point, And the lightning bolt uh, does the final uh, two points required but three total damage down to negative one. And miraculously enough, we, uh, we take an opponent from 22 life down to negative one in one single blow um, with a, a basic a non-combo a non-combo aggro deck in the old school format um, on combo that's not even remotely outside the realm of feasible with seven cards and this much mana uh, but I was pretty impressed but this this also this game also informed me that it may be worthwhile to consider in this deck like at least one copy of berserk because berserk would have made this sequence of plays a lot easier to do. The only thing that makes me a little timorous about it is that I don't... The Unstable Mutations are great, so don't get me wrong. I think the card is perfect for this deck. However, I think it's very situational, and I think you have to be very careful about where you're using it. And I think having a fifth one of them, essentially, because I look at Berserk as kind of being the same thing, um, is being kind of risky because... You know, if I don't have a threat, then it's garbage. If I don't have a way to pump the threat, i.e. unstable mutations, it's kind of garbage. Um, 
you know, but even like you know, using it on like a, a free to do six is still pretty good, especially if you're racing and you can't afford to take the one damage off the free. Um, so I don't know, you know, it's 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 very interesting to me, and I think it's worth consideration because it would have helped out at least here. Uh, but I also don't want to like you know do like you know uh, you know causal analysis in a vacuum just this game uh because one i don't think the deck that i'm playing against is an extremely common archetype or strategy in the old school format but it's not you know impossible to see um you know uh, and, and also i just I, I think against some decks it's just, it's just too situational um for instance like against the deck i think the unstable mutations come out almost every time against that deck because you know four swords to plowshares probably some number of lightning bolts fireball disenchants Unstable mutation is bad. You're going to ten generally tend to bring in the blast package um, against that deck. So that was this game. Um, you know, I'll play uh, play one more for you guys. I'm not going to play that whole match. It was very long. Uh, but I'll play one more. Uh, I believe this is... No, no, this is not. This is the deck, I want to say. I believe this is us playing the deck, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So we're playing, uh, no, correction, I'm sorry. This is actually a different deck. So I've not shown you this deck yet. This deck is very interesting. Um, what it is, is, um, is a Basalt Monolith deck. So Basalt Monolith, at this point in time, comboed very well with a card called uh, Power Artifact. And what it essentially allows you to do is make infinite mana, infinite colorless mana, uh, which allows you to either find a Fireball and win with that card, or find Brain Geyser and force your opponent to mill themselves. So we uh, we have a pretty stellar hand. I uh, have an ancestral uh, recall and a bunch of mocks in to get rid of uh, some of these cards. I go ahead and find the power artifact here uh, because it'll allow me to get my basalt monolith online. And my thinking is that I have the city of brass to enable finding um, to enable. F I'm sorry, the uh, city of brass to enable me to uh, Sylvan Library and find a th uh, fireball. But I actually opt to go for the ancestral recall to further inform my decision and in draw into more cards. I don't try to cast it there because I figure my opponent is likely up on counter magic at that point in time, and I would prefer to have my own counter spell to protect the Ancestral. I do cast the Sylvan Library out at this point in time because it's essentially free because it still allows me to cast the Ancestral with counter backup. Opponent plays uh, a Mistress Factory, and they start burning my face, and at this point I'm pretty positive they're on a counter spell, but they don't counter there. Um, power Sync is not bad because it'll allow me to tap my opponent out. Um, I'm kind of disappointed with what I find with... Um, the Sylvan Library, I've kind of hoped to find one of my four of Fireballs in the top 20, but I have not. So, opponent does cast Psionic Blast. I allow it to happen because I don't want to waste my counter spell on a card that essentially right now says it does nothing. Uh, because my life total is not relevant. Once I go off, I'm going to win instantly. Um, so, I go down to 9 here. Opponent's still showing counter magic. Still kind of missing here. So, I go ahead and play out um, Transmute as the... Uh, as the um, as the bait spell. Now my thinking is I'm going to have to manage rate on this following turn because I want to use Jame Day Tome to uh, get through my deck. Um, I do have to counter this, I think, because I, I think Sylvan's going to allow me to see a, a lot of cards. This resolves here. Um, on my turn, I end up whiffing again with the Sylvan Library. So I draw both these cards in hopes that I can utilize the Mana Drain Mana um, to... Uh, well, to one, you know, enchant this thing, but but also utilize uh, the mana to uh, use Jame Day Tome to find a fireball. I unfortunately do not, and I guess I'm just playing around here because uh, it's very close. Mirror Universe, if I had one more turn, would keep me alive because it would change life totals, but Mirror Universe, unfortunately, only works on upkeep, um, which stinks. So the Serendib Jin is going to win the game here, and my opponent just casts Psionic Blast and kills me. So we kind of missed pretty bad there, but I think we got a little little bit unlucky. Um, we saw a ton of cards, 10 more than our opponent, and just never found a 4 of that's in our deck. So we go to game 2. And this game, I believe you get to see how the deck is supposed to work. So this hand is weird. Um, <coughs> what my plan is here is to play out my mana, because I don't want to get like mind twisted out randomly if they like for some reason have that. And draw into a land next turn, and ideally Demonic Tutor for an Ancestral, um, and then draw into more gas. 
So the big sell to me on this hand is, one, I have one half of my combo. Two, I think Red Elemental Blast is going to be really good against my opponent's threats, i.e. Serendib Jin and Serendib Afrits. And City in a Bottle is also epically good against those cards. So I have protection from counter magic in the form of Red Elemental Blast, and I have the ability to remove their bi their best th uh, permanent base threats. They play Tundra and pass it back. I draw into the Ancestral Recall naturally, so I kind of uh, YOLO it here and um, go for the Ancestral. And find the Black Mana to cast the Demonic, find the Time Walk to draw uh, some more... And now I feel like I'm pretty well set up. Now, the City of Brass is not great. I only have two of them in the deck. But it's not very good with City in a Bottle. But I do want to play it out because I want availability of red mana. I don't cast the Basalt Monolith here, opting instead to go for one more mana draw to get the Basalt Monolith online so I can protect it with my counter spell. Take three. Opponent's trying to burn us out. That's fine by me. I don't really care about taking like this early incremental damage from their spells at the cost of a card in their hand. Uh, because, like I said, I'm not looking to, to win incrementally. I'm looking to win all at one time with this deck. It's a combo deck. I go ahead and counter this back. That's why I waited, is because I figured they were on counter magic. And the Basalt Monolith is very central to my plans for this deck. We get hit for two, and I believe opponent does nothing. So we draw the Fireball. And unfortunately, we cannot counter that. So we're going to wait. I actually do counter this, which I think should be done. I think that's a, a, a good spell to counter. Um, I misclick here. I accidentally uh, choose the cards that I don't want to keep. <laughs> um, and that sucks. So we have City in a Bottle and Power Artifact, which is not good. My opponent has to be looking at my uh, what I discarded and thinking, oh, I'm dead next turn. But they're not. I just misclicked. So the game goes on, even though I think it possibly could have ended there. But Blue Elemental Blast is certainly a thing. We cast this out, uh, get rid of their Jin, and also get rid of our uh, our Pain Land there, City of Brass. Ivory Tower does nothing, so they draw us into a whole slew of cards. And uh, I opt to go for it. I mean, they could have a Blue Elemental Blast, but I think it's worth doing here. So I go ahead, and this is a very lengthy process, but Power Artifact... Basically says, activated cost costs two less, which means that I can make three mana and pay one to untap it. So it makes two mana every cycle, and eventually we get to uh, 22, I want to say. and uh, Or 21, which is one more than enough to kill them. And go ahead and target them with a lethal fireball. As you'll see here, we get blue elemental blasted, which, which stinks. And what I opt to do here is make some mana and go for a transmute artifact on one of the Moxen to change it over into a uh, Jame Day Tome to get ahead on cards. So we go ahead and draw here, find another Fireball, and decide that it's probably worth uh, making a bunch of mana and casting out the Mirror Universe just in case they found a Disenchant effect. I'm going to leave the other monolith in hand, though, because it just makes sense to hide information. I think the most relevant artifact that I have on the board is actually Jame Day Tome right now. Me, personally. I go ahead and change my life total up. Now, maybe I'm being cowardly here, but I, I actually don't opt to fireball them this turn. I actually want to try to find some interaction, like find a power sink to tap them down on the end of their turn. Or find, you know, a secondary fireball or a counter spell. And they continue to try to burn us out. It's very likely they just have nothing. No, no counter magic in hand. But I just think it's worth waiting. And we just continue to put our permanents on the board. We do have Time Twister in the deck and a Wheel of Fortune. So I prefer to have my permanents on board. I play the third Monolith out. Because it doesn't make much sense to hold it. Just in case they do Twister. Because I really just don't want to redraw that card. That card's not that good right now. I draw into the bolt, or I'm sorry, not the bolt, the fireball, and say, hey, let's go for it. I draw first. Don't hit anything relevant, just another uh, land card. <clears throat> so, 
we uh, get to 12 here and then just kill them with uh, Lethal Fireball. And that is game two of Power Artifact, Power Monolith combo versus um, Jeskai Tempo, I guess. Jeskai Midrange, really. Game three. So I have Sitting in a Bottle, and I have a lot of mana, uh, plus Time Twister. So I kind of like this hand. And drawing a Disrupting Scepter is also not bad because it appears their deck tends to eat up cards pretty quick. They do have a very early Ancestral, which is not good for us. It puts them up a lot of cards. I actually don't mind drawing the mana here. They disenchant this, which is great for me because I have a second one. I'm not really too worried about them disenchanting my stuff. I get Strip Mind. Fine as well because I'm on a heavy mana draw. They counterspell my next monolith, so I'm out of monoliths now, but that's alright. I don't have the combo in hand, and I have a uh, time pusher to kind of get the monoliths back if I need to have more in my deck. Play another one. My opponent kind of laughs because I'm on mono, the mono monolith draw. I actually just use it fairly here to cast the Disrupting Scepter out. I get Psionic Blasted. My opponent's down to four cards at this point, though, after the draw. Play land. And they Wheel of Fortune, which I think is kind of risky, but they have the they luck out and draw into a time uh, time walk, which is actually a pretty good pull for them. We get Time Twistered here, which my last hand was actually better. It had the kill in it. And then they disenchant the, um, the Basalt Monolith. I say okay to that, because I can't really do anything else. And although I'm probably dead next turn with them on five cards, I do have the kill here. I go for an Ancestral off of Regrowth, uh, Time Walk, into another turn, discard the useless land cards in my hand, draw into a Black Lotus, which is fine, uh, play out the Mistress Workshop to cast Basalt or Monolith with one card, power it up, and at this point, and this is a rather lengthy process, we actually utilize the secondary win condition, which is Brain Geyser. Brain Geyser is actually a great win condition to have available in your deck because it does beat um, Circle of Protection Red. Circle Protection Red is a problem, and my opponent was actually telling me they had it in hand. So, we go ahead and make a bazillion mana here for 47 to be exact. And mill their 46 card deck down to uh, negative 1 cards, killing them. So this is Power Artifact and what it does. Um, of the decks I was playing today... I tend to like the, the Rug deck a little bit better than the Power deck. I think power the Power deck is very good, but there's just a lot of dead cards in it, and that's kind of what you run into when you play like a hard combo deck like this. Um, the problem I have with it, and like you saw our draws too, especially in this format where you don't have like Brainstorms and Ponders and Preordains, you know, you can get weird draws where you have like three Power Artifacts or three Basalt Monoliths. Which just tends to be pretty bad. I, I guess Power Artifact is not completely dead. You can equip it to a uh, Disrupting Scepter and make it cost 1 to force them to discard. Or you can equip it to a Jame Day Tome and make it cost 2 to draw an extra card. Um, but that's not really my idea of broken um, or extremely good. You know, it's essentially 2 for 1 in yourself to make, you know, a card that's trying to accrue you. Or I'm sorry, it's 1 for 2 in yourself to make a card that is attempting to accrue two-for-one advantage, you know, better. But it still takes the same amount of time to draw the same amount of cards, so you're really not gaining that much tempo when you do that. So I guess at the end of the day, what I'm getting after is the Power Artifact and Basalt Monolith have to have to pair together. Um, if you just draw three Power Artifacts or four Power Artifacts or three Monoliths, um, they don't really do all that much on their own. Um, except for make a ton of mana. So, interesting deck. Very cool. Um, you know, I think we got a little lucky here to win this uh, because the opponent kind of missed... Well, they didn't miss... They, I, I was pretty sure on the time walk turn they'd be able to kill me, but their deck's a little less aggressive than, like, my rug deck, for instance, and they just didn't have enough burn to, to seal the deal there. Um, so you're able to get there. Uh, but th very cool deck. Very interesting. And I'll do a quick rundown of this deck as well, just so you can kind of see what the deck looks like um, in its its raw form. Uh, power Artifact. 
So Power Artifact, all of the Artifact Accelerant you could ever want, three Cities of Brass, three Islands to play around Blood Moon, one Library of Alexandria, very standard, one Mishra's Workshop, um, just to get a fast Basalt Monolith out, um, if need be, one Strip Mine, and then just some non-basics down here. Um, as far as Counter Magic Package, you have two Counter Spells, one Mana Drain, and then you have actually three Power Sinks. Power Sink becomes a lot better when you're capable of producing infinite colorless mana. And actually, Spell Burst even does at that point. But Power Sync's just better. And the idea with Power Sync is, is that you force them to tap... And we never saw this interaction. You force them to tap out on their end step because they're forced to pay for whatever... Pay whatever they can pay. And once you get them tapped out, then you just go for the combo kill against the Permission-style decks with Fireball on the following turn. Um, two Jame Day Tomes because drawing more cards is always good. Disrupting Scepter because, you know, again... Denying your opponent cards is also good. It's two for one or an investment two for one card. Mirror Universe, not bad. Um, it's kind of in the deck, you know, with the hope that, you know, one day Magic will allow us to manipulate the rule set in it. I doubt that'll ever happen. It'd be very cool if we could go to like old uh, last in, first out rules or batch rules or stack rules. Uh, you know, some of the stuff that, that used to be things in Magic or just play with man mana burn. Um, but, you know, back in the day, Mew Universe used to be a great win con. Uh, so in spirit of that, I, I put it in the deck. It probably shouldn't be in there. Um, it is a cool win con, though, for like when you're playing by old school rules. Because essentially what you can do is cast this thing out. And then on your upkeep, when you're at, like, you know, you can get yourself down to two or three life, you can um, you can actually tap your City of Brass or, or do damage to yourself to go below uh, zero life. And because the way damage used to work is state-based effects were not resolved until the end of the given step that you were on. You could sacrifice the Mirror Universe to, you know, be you could be at negative five life or whatever, you know, like Lightning Bolt yourself or Fireball yourself. Um, an opponent really can't respond to it because they could Lightning Bolt you again, but you're still just at like negative eight at that point, let's say. And, you know, before you pass main one, or I'm sorry, before you pass your upkeep, you exchange life totals with them and give them the negative eight life total. Unless they can, like, cast three or four healing selves, uh, they're probably going to die. Um, so, that's in the deck. And actually, it was not irrelevant. It allowed me to uh, get a little bit healthier in one of these games. So, it's it's a way to gain life in a, you know, essentially a blue-based deck, a blue-based combo deck. So, it's still not horrendous, but it's, it's not really great either. It just essentially buys you some time. Um... But this is the deck, a uh, pretty cool deck. Uh, I don't have as much fun playing this as I do like the deck, which is more of a hard control deck, not a, a combo control deck. And I would say this deck is more so a combo deck. Um, it realistically is using its counter magic, um, not to buy time um, or stall the opponent, but it's using its counter magic to protect its, its, its own um, inherently busted combo. Um, a couple cool things about the sideboard, uh, cards that I really haven't talked about with, uh, with anyone on my, uh, on my, uh, channel on YouTube yet. Uh, we do have one channel in here, which is, is cool because channel can combo out on turn one with, you know, a fireball, which is pretty sweet. Um, Guardian Beast, I think is interesting because it actually does protect against the, the white based removal at Disenchant specifically. Uh, the Basalt Monolith, um... The only issue with it is, is you have to actually have your Basalt Monolith enchanted with Power Artifact before you play the Guardian Beast, which is kind of awkward, uh, but against decks that you're pretty sure are going to sideboard in, like, three to four Shatters, um, Guardian Beast tends to be pretty good. Um, have one one Disenchant sideboard, because I think it's just, you tend to want to have at least one. Um, and then a, a Blast Package, uh, a couple of cities, a or cities in a bottle as well. Uh, because it, you know, it destroys some of the premier threats that you saw in the last deck that we actually did a quick deck tech on and, and did some gameplay with uh, the uh, the rug deck. So Serendib, uh, Jin, Afrit, uh, Juzam, Jin, um, you know, you name it. There's a lot of great Arabian Nights uh, efficient threats um, that came at a marginal cost of like losing a life during your upkeep. Uh, Urnum Jin, another good one. Flying Man, another one. So, you know, there's a lot of lot of very good cards that it can actually just get rid of for you. Um, so. This is Power Artifact. Uh, deck before was uh, what I call uh, Rug Urnum or Rug Rug Zoo Rug Delver um, in the old school format. Very cool format, and I'd recommend if you've never given it a try, uh, give it a try sometime. So all of these decks are built with cards that were printed uh, pre 1995. Um, 
And uh, it's actually a pretty fun play experience. Uh, it tends to be longer games, but they can obviously be short as well. Um, and, and most of the archetypes are actually viable in it. So uh, I even have a reanimator build, as you can see over here in my deck listings. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, short uh, video series on... Um, on the old school format and uh hope if you're on mtgo sometime and you have the card pool to support it you uh send me a friend invite or add buddy or whatever it is on mtgo and we uh we can play a game uh take care now